Well, good afternoon. I hope everyone's smiling. You know, this day and age, I, I thought we should start with this, this little image here. I asked the jury, is that the face of a mass murderer? Well, in this day and age, we haven't seen as many faces as we thought we were going to for the last few years. So with masks off, we will uh, we'll take a little journey into the story of, of Smiley Face, which doesn't seem to want to go ahead here. And there we go. And we see smiles everywhere. But I don't know that we always think about the Worcester connection. That, you know, whether even if it's cold and they're complaining about Bernie, Bernie Madoff in Boston, they're still thinking about that smile. I bet if you, if you thought of today about the number of times you've seen Smiley Face, perhaps in the news, newspaper or on television, you've seen a reference to it everywhere. Maybe even the Dunkin' Donuts? You never know who's going to pick up on that smile because it's that popular. It's the universal symbol of happiness and goodwill. And our job today is to remind people, as this New Yorker cartoon said, oh, look who's back. No, Smiley Face never went anywhere. When, once he was born in Worcester, it's all, it's all been a success from there on in. So my job today is to tell you a little bit about the story of how Smiley Face came to be. And certainly Smiley Face is the American icon. If you think of what you see everywhere, you see a smiley face everywhere. It's the international symbol of happiness and goodwill. And it's Worcester's own. Our story starts here, just around the corner. If, if you came up past St. John's to come here today, our story starts at what today is Hanover Insurance on Lincoln Street, just around the corner. 440 Lincoln Street, it's 1962, 63. And what's happening? State mutual assurance companies are merging, not really merging, that's the wrong term, are purchasing controlling interests in other mutual companies. They can't merge because they're mutual companies, but they're getting a lot more ownership or impact from other agencies, other companies. And what happened then was very much like what's happened in the last few years. When you might go to your desk and see a new colleague next to you and think, who's that and what are they doing and where's my job going? It was a little bit of confusion. So enter these three characters, and they together are responsible for Smiley Face. The man on the left was Jack Adam. Jack Adam was very influential in the creation of the Greater Worcester Community Foundation. You might know him from that association. But he really was the VP, a, a major VP for marketing and public relations at the state mutual companies. And he decided that in this moment of when people were a little bit uncertain what was happening to the company, that they needed to have a, a happier environment. Logical, logical decision. So he goes to the woman in the middle. Her name was Joy Young, and she was the person in charge of getting all their marketing materials together. He went to Joy Young and said, let's put a smile on people's faces around this place and cheer everybody up. Everything is fine. No one's, you know, it's all progress. We're going to be fine. So Joy Young goes to the man on the right, Harvey Ball, who is their contract designer. If they needed a flyer, they went to Harvey Ball. He had an office on Main Street in Worcester, was not at the mutual companies, but he was their go-to guy. He wanted, if you needed a birthday invitation, you'd have your go-to designer. That's what Harvey Ball was. So Joy Young goes to him and says, we'd like to have a smile campaign, and would you create us a smiley icon? She asked him to create a smile. So if you look at the balloons, imagine the balloons on the tables without the eyes. That's what she wanted. She wanted just a mouth and a smile. It was Harvey Ball who decided that he couldn't do just the mouth. So what he does, whoops, there we go. There's Harvey. So he's, just to back up a little bit, he's a graduate of the Worcester Art Museum School. He has this downtown agency. If you've been past the Korean War Memorial in downtown Worcester near Union Station, he designed that for Frank Carroll. He's responsible for lots of designs, but she hires him. And as you can see here, perhaps, she paid him $45 for the creation of that button and $240 for the entire campaign. The entire campaign is one of the clues that it's more than just the smile. So here's what Harvey does. He, takes a, he draws a perfect circle. He says it should be bright yellow. I once asked him, what yellow? If you're familiar with color systems, there's a PMS system, which is, which is a color matching system. I called him once, and they, there are 
thousands of numbers. I said, which number yellow is it? And he says, oh, I don't know. Just pick a bright yellow you like. So it's a bright yellow. Notice small oval eyes. The right one is slightly larger than the left one. So imagine you're making a smiley face and you're using a pencil. You just bear down a little bit harder on the right one and it's a little bit longer. That's, in essence, what happened. And the mouth is not a perfect arc. Think about the Mona Lisa. And now it's not a perfect arc. And the ends are thicker in the middle. They are convex, not concave or straight lines. Those are all the keys to a Harvey Ball original smiley face that he creates for Joy Young in response to Jack Adam in December of 1963. There's a smiley face song. I invite you to go home and Google it, the smiley face song. I will not sing it for you because I don't want to ruin your afternoon. <laughs> but it, it says in December of 1963, he created this smile. But, but remember, what she really wanted was just the mouth. She wanted the smile. Imagine why he added the eyes. He assured her that without the eyes, you could wear it upside down. So that was Harvey Ball saying, no, 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 you want a, a happier environment. Let's add the eyes, and then, then there will be no confusion. But remember it was part of a campaign. The campaign is announced on January 3rd of 1964 in the Mutualite. Did anyone, any of you ever work for state mutual companies? Yeah, you might remember the Mutualite. She's way too young. Uh, <laughs> you might remember the Mutualite. Um, it was the in-house newsletter, and it was announced on January 3rd of 1964 that we were going to have this smile effort. And um, all employees of all the mutual companies were going to smile and see what the influence was. If you can see that. The word is out. Smile. You're on candid camera. Now, I bet you all remember that show. And that was the impetus for the larger campaign in the office. Smile. You love being here, you love our clients, you love selling insurance, just smile and we might sneak up on you and take a picture of you as you're smiling. We'll see what happens if you get smiled, if you get smiled, they called it, um, in the workplace. But look at the up here, a smile is part of my attire in the upper right hand. There's no reference to the smiley face pin there. It's a campaign, it's not just a pin. The lower one, smile. I can't see all of what it says, something like when you say that. Um, and the pin is, a, is essentially the giveaway. It's your billboard that you would wear when you're in the office or it's something you would give to a client. And then the, the, the pin would also appear in their advertising. Our field men are narrow-minded. A picture of our man in Michigan. They wanted all their agents to smile. And they would give them decals to put in their store windows. They'd give them buttons to give away because they were the smile company. And because it was the old days, they would make all the stickers to put on their, their black and white printed handouts. No color, no color photocopying in those days. It was all straightforward. So the, the stickers would start appearing everywhere, as did the buttons. And here you see one of the original buttons are about the size of a quarter. And you can tell an original because inside is this paper liner. The Smile Insurance Companies, which are Mutual Guarantee Mutual and State Mutual of America. Later, they print that on the inside of the yellow button. Lots of people say to me, I think I have an original smiley face button. You need to see if it has the paper or the, the print on the inside. Now, you can see there the initial order of 100 smile buttons went away in no time flat. It was not thought to be an enormous campaign. It wasn't going to take over the world. It didn't make the Worcester newspaper until 1967, three years later. It was an internal happiness and goodwill campaign. The second order was 10,000. They were that popular. And as I said, they would sneak up on you. And you might be the winner of the best smile award for the week or the month. And imagine how comfortable you'd be 
if you were sitting there answering the phone, you were saying, oh, yes, we can fix your claim right away. And you got photographed, and you got the big button. I don't know that you could get away with that in today's climate, but you certainly could do it then. And here's June Worthington of the underwriting department, because she had the best smile for 1964. But look at the smile on the big button. It's not a Harvey Ball smile, but I bet he drew that. Very interesting how it gets corrupted along the way. They were so happy with it, they even were, were printing songs. The claims department came up with this Ode to a Smile button that was published in February of 1964. That was the week that was. Just think about if you were like me, were very much alive in the 60s in some of the songs you were hearing from, from artists on, on the television or the radio. This was the week that was. The big campaign got out of the way. Smile buttons were the order of the day. Big signs, little signs, all over the place. It was not about a button so much as the campaign. Smile, never dare to frown. The smile campaign is here to stay. Smile, 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 smile. And if you were a customer and you went to the, to the lobby of 440 Lincoln Street, you could have a smile on us. This is a photograph of the counter with a plastic topiary tree and all those smile buttons were there for you to take. Given now, as it says, to over 20,000 guests who visited annually, it really caught on. And once they were given a smile, they were never a stranger. Um, look at the look at the investment and in how how beautiful that sign was. It's a it's a it's somebody drew it with a magic marker. It was it was thought to be an in-house campaign. And just like at Dunkin' Donuts, the guys on the left were enjoying smiley face donuts at one of their breaks. Smiley thing theme took over the whole whole company. And if you look on the lapel of the guy on the right, he's wearing his smile button. And you've got the stewardesses who are, who are going into Worcester Airport, the flight attendants in today's language, wearing their smile buttons, and the nuns from St. Peter's wearing smile buttons on their habits. <coughs> Smiley face started to take over Worcester by 1965-66. Again, it doesn't make the newspaper until 1967. And what the, what the state mutual companies were prouder of, most proud of, was that within a couple of years, they had given away more smile buttons than Avis We Try, we try Harder. Avis rental cars, We Try Harder, they were thought to be the ones who captured the market. And this little campaign that initiated in Worcester as an in-house campaign had superseded them. And then in 1967, the smile button catches the public fancy. That's the first reference, 1967, three years later. We at the Worcester Historical Museum went to the newspapers for January of 1964, February of 1964, March of 1964, and thought this was going to be big news. It wasn't big news. It was just like if you had a, I don't know, a pink bow tie party here and didn't catch on for three or four years. So it was a quick campaign, though. But by 1968-69, it had pretty much run its course at the state mutual companies. Excuse me, Bill. I think your mic isn't working. Oh, it's not working. OK. Hit it see Well, is it working now? OK. Well, we'll proceed from here. You need to speak up a little bit for the people in the OK. Well, we can turn this up if you can't hear in the back. If you can't hear in the back, be sure to raise your hand because we can, we can turn it up. Is it good now? Yes. All right. Sorry it was off. Don't hesitate. It's dark in here. I could fall asleep. <laughs> you know, don't hesitate. Don't hesitate. So it, by 1968 or so, or maybe 69, the campaign at State Mutual was pretty much over. It's quick. But Smiley Face doesn't stay in Worcester. And this is where he goes international. He goes to Seattle. This is David Stern. He was an ad man in Seattle. He and his wife came to the East Coast, to New York City, to attend a, a Broadway production, have a weekend, you know. And they're walking down the street, and one of those smile buttons that they had made tens of thousands of was on a, a table for a flea market. It must have been one of the paper ones, because it didn't stay state mutual. 
I've spoken with Davis during it at some length. He tells the people of the state of Washington that he created Smiley Face. We set him straight. Um, and he understands that. He bought the button and then he took it back to Seattle and he used it in an advertising campaign, but a big campaign. He was the ad man for University Federal Savings and Loan. So they made wallpaper, they made signs, they gave away those little squeeze coin purses that everybody used to have a thousand years ago. Has this gone off? It looks like it has. It went off again, didn't it? Hmm. Is it on now? Maybe we should turn it up. There's a red light that I noticed was out. Better? Yeah. Okay. Well, well, yell if it goes off again. It just did. It just did. You give me that. I'm going to see if we can just replace it. There's supposed to be some batteries in it. Okay. Give that a shot. This would be a good time for me to sing the smiley face song because you might not hear it. Give a little giggle, grin a little grin. Do your imitation of the smiley face pin. Open up your heart and let the sun shine in and share it with your neighbors and your next of kin. Share it with your neighbors and your next of kin. That's the chorus. There are five verses of history. It was written by Harvey Ball's son, Charlie Ball, and I would encourage you to Google it when you go home and, and sing it. We hear it regularly at the Worcester Historical Museum, and I will tell you that um, it's a catchy tune. It's a, it's a fun song. It's a nice history about him being approached and doing it, and, and, and he made the world smile. <clears throat> so let's try to do some of this, and again, if you can't hear me, just speak up, and we'll see if we get the microphone back. How about that? So David Stern is doing this for a bank in Seattle. Seattle, on the West Coast, has an international market. People are coming to Seattle from all over the Pacific, and they're banking here because it's university, it's a university bank. So they don't make 10,000 buttons. Their first order is like a quarter of a million buttons. And they make all sorts of things. In addition to using it for advertising purposes, do you see the relationship to the ads from State Mutual? It's the same button. Their initial order was 25,000. As you see, a, a few months later, it was 150,000. And he, I, when I spoke to him, he said, I, I'm, I'm willing to bet we ordered half a million of those buttons. They're the people who really take it to a broader scale than Worcester. And it appears on everything for the bank. Oh, well, good. Maybe we got it. <laughs> So it appears on everything for the banks. Some of you remember the days when you could get a thermometer from the bank. It would be on there. Remember those barometers that had the little fuzz spot and it was blue and it would turn pink. It was supposed to turn back and it would never turn back again. It was a one shot. They put smiley face on all those sorts of things. So they gave it away right and left, backwards, forwards, upside down and to everyone. Let's see how we do now. Now we've got a green light. Uh-oh. So David Stern even runs to be for being the mayor of Seattle based upon his smiley face campaign. Look at that. He's he's he is has decided again, read the histories of, of Washington State and go to the first and they will and he will tell you that he created smiley face. He did a lot to popularize it. But there's another level to the story. <clears throat> From Seattle, Smiley Fest goes to Philadelphia, just about the same time, 1971. And these two brothers, David and Murray Spain, own card shops in Philadelphia. And they take Smiley Face and they go crazy with it because they put it on everything. The first thing they do is they redesign it a little bit. They simplify it. They make the, the eyes a little bit bigger. They use a plate to make the mouth. They literally lay a plate on the, on, the, on the piece of cardboard and make straight ends because it's easier to produce. This is their original design. It was at the Worcester Historical Museum a few years ago. It's their very original. And guess what it's made on? The card, cardboard liner of a pizza box. Like it took Charlie, uh, excuse me, Harvey Ball about two minutes to make his original. It took them about two minutes to make their next version of Smiley Face. 
he thought they thought the eyes were a little bit too thin and it would stand up a little bit more to marketing this way. And you see here, you know, have a happy day, some of their posters in an exhibit at the museum and some of the things that they put it on. But we'll talk a little bit more about that after a while. They were a very specific business in the Philadelphia area. They had card shops. They were merchandisers. They were not selling insurance. Their business was based upon who came in the door and who bought what on a regular basis. So needless to say, Smiley Face appeared on lots of things. And here's a very out of, out of color um, photograph of their booth at a trade show in Atlantic City. This one's in early 1970. And look at the variety of things that they put Smiley Face on. Cards of all sorts, lawn signs, t-shirts. They're the people who took it to the next marketing level. And they didn't hold back. And they are the people who copyrighted Have a Happy Day. So it was the smile face, Have a Happy Day. If you see a button with that, you know immediately it's Spain Brothers. And they're the people who were responsible for getting on the cover of Mad Magazine and lots of national publications long before it ever appeared, um, thanks to the Telegram and Gazette or the work of Harvey Ball because in that case, it was a one-shot campaign that was over. These folks knew that it had actually t taken its place in American culture, and they were going to build on it. So here's someone that agreed to I love you. I'm sorry, you little devil. There's a, there was a sm card that was a smile on the outside, and you opened up, and in the inside, it was a frowny face. On the outside, it said, Happy birthday. On the inside, it said, tomorrow, you can go back to your normal self. So if the inspiration for the first one was smile, you're on candid camera, think for a moment about the television programs you might have watched in the 70s. And what would be the inspiration for this little, this edgy, this slightly more uh, negative approach to smiling the face? Anybody have an idea what it might be? It was laugh-in. Remember laugh-in? Somebody get hit over the head with a pocketbook, or there would be some, you know, negative connotation of something. That was their inspiration. Was smile, was was laughing, and they took the world by storm. They ran card shops. They went to trade shows, as you saw. So what they did was they went to their fellow merchandisers and said, "If you put smiley face on your your product, mugs, creamers, um, all sorts of things." and sell them to us at a reduced price, just go ahead and do it. We're not looking for a contract. We're not looking for a long-term agreement. We're just looking for merchandise. And as a result, that merchandise is everywhere. If you went to the fair in Worcester, Massachusetts in the 1970s, you could buy wastebaskets and t-shirts with smiley face on them. If you went to Millbury Motors, they would be using smiley face in an ad campaign. If you were renting an apartment in Northborough, they were using smiley face as the impetus for you to, to participate. It had gone international at that point. And here is this illustration from the um, New Yorker. I think it's 1970, not 71. Uh, and this is smiley face, almost in the original. And Harvey Ball told me that when his sister brought him that copy of the New Yorker, as he was not a regular New Yorker reader, he knew that he had done something that had captured the world's imagination. Worcester had, had made it at that point, and Harvey Ball was proud of it. So, whoops, went the wrong way, sorry. So, the Spain brothers, this is Murray Spain, standing in front of the back of their delivery trucks. They had 30-something card shops. They told me that they felt they had a successful weekend of sales when they saw their little bags that the cards went into, the paper bags, all over the streets of Philadelphia on, on Sunday or Monday morning because they put smiley face on everything. It was everywhere. They were on What's My Line as the creators of Smiley Face, and they truly believed that they were. Um, they have since then understood that they are not, and they're very respectful of Harvey Ball, but they are the merchandising people for Smiley Face. When they sold their businesses a few years ago and I went to visit them, I said, well, how successful were you? 
remember the numbers that Harvey Ball got paid, 45 and $240. They said that in two years they made basically a couple of million dollars off their sales of smiley faces in the 1970s. They were very successful, they were merchandisers. And truly, it's on everything. I bet if you went through your house, you would find smiley face stuff that you didn't buy yesterday. You might have been around forever. If you go to a flea market, it is literally everywhere. My favorite were toilet seats. <laughs> there are two known to exist in the collector, who's now a blackjack dealer in Las Vegas, has them. I've tried to pry them away from him. You could buy them from the back of, of um, well, one of the opportunities to buy it was the back of the, the Sunday newspaper insert, the glossy insert, where you could buy all sorts of tchotchkes and things. You lifted the lid, and there was a smiley face on the inside. He has a pink one, and he has a red one. Oh, just phenomenal. They were everywhere. Light fixtures, waste baskets. They were truly, smiley face took the world by storm. And then enter this French newspaper from 1971 or 72. And look what's on the cover. Smiley face. And whose smiley face does that look like? It looks pretty much like Harvey Ball's smiley face. Except that it was published by Nicholas Lufrani. And he has since then told the world that he created smiley face in the spirit of the Spain brothers and of, of, of David Stern, using basically Harvey's design. But he had the edge, he was in Europe, and he was able to get all sorts of licenses and trademarks. The important thing to remember in all of this is that no one before him had trademarked it. Harvey Ball wasn't creating an international icon. He was doing an, inter an internal happiness campaign for the state mutual companies. This guy has it trademarked everywhere he possibly can. So he's in part responsible for it e going even further in the 20th century, in the 1980s and 90s, that appears on lots of things. And many of those things are because he has licensed them. Others are just using it. The difference is that he, his license in America currently is without the circle. Two eyes and a mouth, no circle. So in response to that, Harvey Ball in 1999 created World Smile Day. And this is Harvey with his giant button and the stamp that was issued that year by the US Postal Service. You might remember that there were a series of stamps of the decades that was one of every on a sheet of 20 stamps, they were all different. And we as members of the American public got to vote on what we would like from that decade. Smiley Face got more votes than anything else in any of the series of, of stamps. But they never made only one. And America Smiles, and it was unveiled at Worcester Center with Harvey Ball in 1999. And at that point, he creates World Smile Day because he wants the world to remember that although there's David Stern, Murray and David Spain and Nicholas Lufrani, but that Smiley Face was the Worcester original. He was proud of it. He wanted Worcester own it. Um, and when you asked him if he was concerned that other people were making a lot of money off of it, he would say, I got paid for the job. And this is a quote. And he said, you know, I can only drive one car at a time and I can only eat one steak at a time. <laughs> he just wanted people to remember that it was the Worcester original. So World Smile Day is a phenomenon to this day. You see the poster from, from last year's World Smile Day. It's, it's, a, it's, op, it's offered by his son, Charlie, who wrote the, the song. And it is a day for everyone in, in the world to remember. It's the first Friday in October, always the first Friday in October. And Smiley Face hits the streets, and everybody loves him. And Worcester takes ownership that day. The, the day has included things as crazy as awards to a pie-eating contest. It's, the reason is to, to put, make people smile. Harvey Ball's legacy to the world, or his, mem, his message to the world, was do an act of kindness, help one person smile. That's the goal of World Smile Day. So, we have, we have this, this incredible legacy. Harvey died in 2001, and the world took notice. 
The New York Times called the, the Worcester Historical Museum that morning with reporters calling from England and France and all sorts of places because the man who gave the world its best smile had died. And it was well noticed by people who understood full well that it was the Worcester original. Harvey's legacy was that he had given the world a smile. And again, I showed you this earlier, he just thought, well, you know, I've done a good thing. And that's all the recognition that he wanted. Now, of course, others have, have squeaked in on the smile campaign. I'm sure you've been to Walmart at some point and through the years you've seen their use of smiley face, although it's tapered back. You could get smiley face pins, you get all sorts of things from Walmart. And here's the next generation of Lufranis. The young Lufrani in a current advertisement from Europe. They're putting smiley face on everything. How about a basketball with smiley face? How about this funky artsy coat? I can imagine that. You look great in that. We should get a rack of those for Shrewsbury. You can get sheets, you can get everything. For a while they had smiley face stores. They, they are making all kinds of things. They are the Spain brothers of the 21st century. They are an enormous corporation, they have the leverage, and notice these smiles don't have the circle. But smiley face was Worcester born. A really nice guy by the name of Harvey Ball had legions of fans all over the world and all over town. His birthday was regularly celebrated by lots of people, and people would come and collect those buttons like crazy. The Harvey Ball is a function of the Worcester Historical Museum every year. For 20 years, we've given an award called the Harvey Ball, known to people locally as the Harvey, for, to someone for making who's made Worcester smile. And it's an event that brings together hundreds of people of all ages and all locations around the community. Last year, oh, here we see. Smiley and some of the attendees, the, the, the outfits go crazy. The excitement is wild, and it's appropriately Worcester given its, its history. Last year, the awards went to the Worcester Red Sox for changing the game in Worcester. The first year, it went to Alan Fletcher, who was then printing Worcester Magazine back when it was an edgy newspaper, and he was given the award for asking people in Worcester to think a little bit differently about themselves. It is the American icon, whether it's at Walmart, whether it's in Paris with the Lufranis, or it's, it's, it's in Seattle or Philadelphia. It is the Worcester original. It is celebrated regularly by people. Here you see lots of hundreds of people forming the world's largest human smile on the plaza of Worcester Common. And you see it on the backs of buildings in Worcester. Worcester is very proud of smiley face. It is the Worcester original. It has taken the world by storm. And that's its brief history. I thank you. <laughs>